Hello everyone. Buongiorno a tutti. My name is Corrado Paina. I'm the executive director at the Italian Chamber of Commerce of Ontario, Canada, ICO Canada. Today with us, we have Tommaso Ebert, whose book, Sergio Marchionne, has been an Italian bestseller. Who's Sergio Marchionne? Who was Sergio Marchionne? Sergio Marchionne was an extraordinary leader and a visionary. Born in Italy, Sergio Marchionne migrated to Canada and uh, as a very young boy, he grew up in the Toronto area, studied philosophy, finance, law, as one of the in auto industry most uh, pragmatic and charismatic executives is widely known for his informal uh, really attitude, his approach to an industry that some years ago was needed some major change and Sergio Marchione brought it. Uh, from you know, from, uh, from his unknown uh, origins in Canada to the top offices and headquarters of the car industry, Sergio was the friend of presidents and the most important and powerful CEOs in the world. Before we get started, I would like to thank APMA, Automotive Part Manufacturers Association, for having partnered with us and having helped helped us to realize, to organize this webinar. APMA is Canadian National Association representing OEM, Original Equipment Manufacturers, producers of parts, equipment, tools, supplies, advanced technology and services for the worldwide automotive industry. The association provides industry representation to both federal and provincial governments, supports regional government initiatives, and creates and executes global marketing initiatives in order to develop trade and business opportunities for their membership. It is my pleasure to welcome Tommaso Ebert, Milan Bureau Chief at Bloomberg News and author of Sergio Marchione. Tommaso has followed some of the most important corporate transactions worldwide, and he chased, as he said, Sergio Marchione for a decade, tracking him around the globe. Tommaso is here with this Tommy today to talk about his book, Sergio Marchione, which narrates the personal experience of a young journalist who later became, in Marchione's world, his affectionate stalker. After Tommaso's introduction, we will proceed with a very exciting panel and we will discuss the legacy of Sergio Marchione. Tommy, welcome and please, the podium is yours. Ciao a tutti, thank you very much uh, for having me tonight. Um, for me, it's a real pleasure uh, to, uh, to speak at your association. Mm, uh, I've uh, written uh, um, a biography of Sergio Marchione, which is not the type typical biography. It's also my story following uh, Sergio now uh, almost uh, uh, three years and a half ago. Uh, and um, because uh, I, I really thought that uh, uh, Sergio deserved someone who has been quite close to 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 his uh, to his view uh, to uh, somehow um, write uh, try to write what what uh, was really his life about and what I I I, I think was his life about and um, and now now that the book has you know uh, there you know it's, it's few years now uh, passed since I, since I wrote the book um, I'm you know I'm quite proud. Uh, uh, of this uh, of this work because I think uh, and I hope uh, uh, that uh, this book is a sort of legacy uh, and um, I'm very satisfied by the fact that uh, uh, many people have read the book uh, many of reader many readers write me uh, they find inspiration from uh, Sergio's uh, uh, life uh, and uh, as I, I I know I know for sure that uh, Sergio would be pleased to be an inspiration for many. Uh, potential new new young leaders. Uh, I've stopped, uh, you know, accepting invitation about my book on Marchione because, you know, after a couple of years, I think you have to to move on. But 
when I when, when I got the request uh, uh, coming from Toronto, I thought it was uh, mandatory uh, to accept uh, and to speak with you tonight, uh, just because I'm really fascinated about uh, uh, Marchionne, uh, uh, Marchionne's period in Toronto when he became a man. Uh, when he, uh, uh, you know, he arrived from Italy when he was 14 uh, without speaking a single word of English, uh, and uh, he grew up uh, in Toronto. He was, uh, as you as you all know, he was very close to the community. Uh, his mom used to live in Toronto, and his uh, his down to earth approach uh, was clearly clear was really clear uh, in, in the city where he grew up. So for me, uh, you know was uh was it i mean it's it's a real pleasure to uh to be here and um, actually uh one of the things i i have i didn't manage to to do when i wrote the book is you know to visit toronto to visit the place uh, like marchioni's places in toronto i just you know google mapped uh, all the places you know where he lived uh, where the school was where he used to uh, make uh, espresso at the circolo dei carabinieri uh which is uh, named after his father concezio and you know one of my goal would be uh, sooner or later to come to Toronto, maybe when and if uh, there will be an English edition of uh, of my book. My book is uh, uh, written in Italian, just because you know I work in English, but you know my my language is Italian, so I prefer to to write it in Italian. I thought it was more intimate the way I can write in Italian than in English. Um, still, we haven't found an English uh, publisher for the book in Italy. Uh, we have sold you know over fifty thousand book, uh, which shows that which makes me really really satisfied uh, um, because uh, I'm somehow uh, sharing uh, um, the experience of Sergio Marchione. Obviously, I, you know, this is not an authorized biography. It's my, my, my view of his, uh, of his uh, life. And he, he, the book was written out of necessity. I found, uh, um, uh, needed to write this story, which was also for me a way to close one chapter of my life uh, and uh, to, I mean, when I started, I decided to write a book in, in the tragic hours when we all understood that Sergio was never going to come back. Uh, um, it was for me also a way um, to tell a difficult moment uh, because uh, I, I was, uh, I, I think it was quite close uh, uh, to to serve in the last period of his life, so it was difficult period also, obviously, uh, much more from others, but also for me. Um, so uh, I really hope to come and that we can do this webinar in a, in a we can transform in a conference sooner or later. I recall the only the only the only time I I came to Toronto was one uh, during one of my uh, uh, trip to Detroit uh, to cover uh, Chrysler and to follow Sergio. And once I booked a flight from Milan to Toronto, from Toronto to Detroit, and I found myself uh, uh, midnight at the Detroit airport waiting for a propeller plane to take me to Detroit uh, um, uh, to get to a gala dinner. I already still remember, it was maybe 10 years ago, uh, managed to get to the gala dinner in time after uh, a quite adventurous, at least for me, I, I was not expecting a propeller plane to take me to Detroit from, from Toronto. Um, so what it is so what this book is about this book is about two obsessions one is my personal obsession as a reporter to be first with news on fiat chrysler as marchione was uh, uh, creating uh, a global car maker out of two struggling regional player and the other is a uh, sergio obsession to fix things and to transform uh, uh in, in uh, fiat uh, into a, a a survival, I would say, uh, when Sergio arrived uh, in, in Turin to run Fiat in 2004, the company was on the brink of bankruptcy. Uh, Marchione managed uh, with his group uh, and his team to transform a rotten car maker into a global uh, leader. And uh, if uh, uh, Stellanti was born, Stellanti is the company which was created by the combination of Fiat Chrysler and Peugeot, uh, if Telanti was born is uh, uh, just because uh, 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 Marchione managed to transform uh, Fiat uh, into a, a viable uh, company, which then was able uh, to 
uh, do the next step with Stellantis, as uh, uh, you all may remember, Macchione uh, has been an advocate of uh, the needs of um, uh, uh, more uh, combination inside the, the car industry, and he told that uh, you know uh, several car maker would not survive. Um, it's interesting that uh, um, the car industry has changed so much in the last four years since I wrote the book when. Uh, I, in, when I uh, discussed with Marchione in 2018, his view for the future of the auto industry, we were at the beginning of the electrification and of the disruption uh, of traditional car makers, uh, and uh, he was uh, expecting the disruption to happen, and his goal was to make Fiat Chrysler able to survive this disruption, which is at happening right now, it would be very interesting uh, to have uh, one one figure like Marchione now to see, uh, you know, uh, which will be at the, which, which would be now his view on the future of the car industry, not when the middle of disruption and uh, it's unclear which will be uh, the, uh, the, the end game. This book is not just a book about the auto industry. This book is the book uh, uh, which tells the story of uh, a proud Italian who was uh, brought to Canada when he was 13. And uh, uh, decided to be the number one in what in, in everything he was trying to achieve in his life. Uh, and uh, by accident, somehow he returned to Italy uh, to run uh, something which is more than just a car maker for the country, Fiat. And I was very, I, I was very fascinated by, you know, the way uh, Sergio uh, managed uh, to um, to bring uh, to Italy uh, his management style, his uh, leadership, uh, um, and uh, to somehow be on one side uh, a very um, disruptive manager, uh, out of the box. Uh, on the other side, uh, I've, I've always been very interested in how he managed to change the culture uh, of uh, uh, one company, which was also a, at the time a sort of uh, uh, example, uh, good example or bad example on how uh, the country was managed. Tommy, thank you very much. And uh, I guess we, you want to go to the square to the question. Should we go to the question? You have something else to add to your presentation, or you prefer? No, no, sorry, I, I I didn't. I, to be honest, I I didn't prepare any any real speech. So I just uh, told you, you know, uh, you know, just some uh, some thoughts uh, as you know to open the conversation. Uh, but you know, I'm here to discuss with you and to, to give you my thoughts and to answer. Any no, questions. and I thank you, thank you very much because the book is excellent. I read it twice, and and uh, it's really a book about an obsession. I think I think you're totally right, and it's very true that at one moment you don't know exactly which obsession we are talking about, because uh, the, the Marchion had such a toxic, in a sense, personality. I guess right, but you know. It's really, you know, if you if you can, you know, there are always in history love stories in a way, you know what I mean? And and, and I think this was some sort of love story, professionally speaking. But I would like to go really straight to the panel, which is a, an outstanding panel. I'm very, very happy to have such guests. We have Flavio Volpe, president of, Auto, of APMA, Automotive Parts Manufacturers Association. Ciao, Flavio. Then we have Paul Di Giulio, associate editor of Panorama Italia magazine, and Sandra Pupatello, former Ontario Minister of Economic Development and Trade, and current president at Canadian Internal International Avenues Ltd. The panel is very interesting because we have a writer, we have a friend and a journalist, we have a former minister and the chief of the Automotive Parts Association. I mean, these four people, in a way or in another, in a longer term or in a shorter term, met Marchione. And then my first question is really about what, what is today, what, what is really the issue today. What did you learn from Marchione? 
Sandra, would you like to start? Sure, thanks, and, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. I think it's great that we're still talking about Sergio Marchione because I really appreciate the opportunity to acknowledge that um, it's been a couple of years at least, uh, but there was a guy at the prime of what he was being able to finally give back to us, and we've lost him. And I, I, I often think about um, how wise he was, especially for the automotive industry, business in general, and, uh, and then just his leadership uh, and how he steered a company that, so let's be honest, uh, Fiat was not always doing well when, it, when he took over in Italy. Uh, I remember visiting him and um, being on the roof of his headquarters where they, I think to this day, still have a, a speed track where they do testing on the top of that roof. And we were sort of looking out into the town and we started uh, you know, having this opportunity to talk and I said, you know, how does it feel? I mean, at one point, uh, I think Italy thought they were losing Fiat completely. It was going bankrupt. Uh, and, and of course, Sergio showed up and I said, you saved the, the, you saved the car company. And he said, listen, I was a pariah. They hated me. I needed security. Um, everywhere I went because the pe you know, and if I, if you think about it, many, many people were laid off at the time um, because I think Fiat had grown, you know, quite fat and lazy as a company and he really came in and cleaned it up, but it didn't make him popular. So, you know, fast forward years later, when all of a sudden he's a hero, he says, I'll always remember those early days when I was the pariah. So I really got a sense that it was a good teaching lesson for everybody. Don't get ahead of your skis here on, on what you think of yourself because you know always remember that it's a it's elusive you know what people think of you you just need to be confident that you're doing the right thing and and I think that the same is true with the decision making that he had uh, when we were dealing with him here in Ontario uh, and you know wanting investments I know Flavio and I were at um, I think it was the launch of the new Charger. We were in Brampton with him. Uh, we were in Windsor with him um, and, and it was always that same uh, stayed understated kind of leadership that we saw publicly but when you had a chance to speak with him uh, you really got a sense that he was very self-aware he really was humble uh, and he knew his stuff uh, I, that would be the summary for me thank you thank you very much Flavio you, when, uh, when when Marchione was at the stop you were a young and ambitious uh, soon to become leader what, what really what what did you get from him because i remember we talked in the past and and really marchione was somebody for you you know sergio is um i think pal will will give a general a better reflection on who sergio was as a person growing up in toronto uh somebody said to me at one point hey did you know that sergio marchi is the president of fiat and i said sergio marchi was a very successful canadian politician but i don't think he's the president of fiat and and somebody said no 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 that's a Sergio Marchione he's a Toronto he's a Toronto guy he grew up here he's on the board at Fiat and when they got into the biggest trouble they had they said um, and when when they were in trouble they were in trouble they were in risk of total bankruptcy they turned to Sergio and well, the thing that impressed me on how he saved Fiat is there was a combination agreement between Fiat and General Motors where General Motors needed to learn how to do small cars. And Fiat needed help in getting into new markets and doing uh, SUVs and CUVs. So they, they swapped stock, 20% of Fiat for 6% of General Motors. And when Fiat ran out of capital, Sergio Marchione, as humble and as conservative as he was, rolled the biggest dice in the history of the automotive sector. And he said, there's a, there's a call option here. General Motors... Uh, would have been required to purchase Fiat if he offered it to them, or they would have had to pay out $2 billion. And I don't know whether Sergio thought that General Motors was going to buy Fiat or whether they were going to give him the $2 billion, but there is nobody in the history of this business for as long as I've been alive or anything that I've studied who would have called that option, and he did. General Motors was in trouble, and they said, Listen, I'd rather give you $2 billion. General Motors, Motors was posting $39 billion in losses in a, certain, in a specific quarter. They said, we'll just pay him the $2 billion. Then Sergio did something that you don't do in the automotive business, which is show your product to the market, to analysts, to your customers. And in 2003, he said, I'm going to show you everything that we're going to do to 2008. And everybody said he lost his mind. 
Why would you show your competitors your product? What he did was he was showing the market and he was showing the public markets that no, we're still in charge here. We do have that essence in the brands that we have, which included, you know, the, some of the greatest brands in, in automotive history, all the, the iconic Italian ones saying, this is what we're going to do in Alfa. This is what we're going to do in Maserati. This is what we're going to do in Ferrari. Well, the market responded and he found a, a firm footing for Fiat. Sandra and I, uh, chased them for an investment in Ontario. And she's being humble about how much work that was. And if the world didn't fall apart in 2008, 2009, Sandra would have secured a Fiat Cinquecento plant in Ontario, which five years before would have been crazy to think because that company was dead. And Sergio launched the Cinquecento, which we all see it's ubiquitous now, but uh, Global Car of the Year in 2008, uh, you know, uh, started the turnaround for the company. And then when the world actually fell apart and one of the most iconic brands in, in, in American history, Chrysler Dodge, um, uh, was in uh, danger of falling apart because the U.S. Treasury had to save it. Uh, out of nowhere, we see this deal where a Sergio Marchione, you know, this kid from uh, Toronto, uh, we claim him. I know Tommy, uh, I'm sure that there, uh, there's a lot of people claiming him in Italy. He made a deal with the Obama administration to say, we'll take Chrysler off your hands. Um, uh, and so they took over 49% of Chrysler, created this Fiat Chrysler, saved two car companies in six years, and then yes. paid back paid back all those loans uh, five years early and created uh, the path that... Uh, I'll stop talking in a second. There's Stellantis is, is Sergio's legacy may not have his signature on it because he left too soon, but he did something that nobody else did, which was publicly campaign for a, for a consolidation partner. He put General Motors on the spot and said, we're not going to work. if w Neither one of us is going to survive if we don't do this thing together. And what didn't happen to General Motors happened with uh, PSA. And, and now last week, the biggest investment in Canadian automotive history, uh, $5 billion in Windsor, uh, his second home in Canada. Yeah. Uh, set Canada for the next 25 years. So he may not be around anymore, but his legacy is that uh, we'll have another generation or two uh, of leaders. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Flavio. Uh, I want to go to Paul. Paul, uh, a leader, right? You saw the making of a leader because you were a friend of him, of his. And, uh, and uh, he was a big smoker. When you were sharing cigarettes with him, when you were young, what were you were talking about? What were his dreams? Well, first of all, piacere, Tommy, and uh, good afternoon, good morning, whenever you, people see this. Um, I'm not, I've read the, your book and I enjoyed it. I've also read three or four other books on Marchione and most other articles written in the last uh, 15 years on um, my friend. I will not speak about his quote unquote business acumen because I'm probably not as equipped as my uh, co-host here. Uh, I, I am, however, a friend. And uh, not only am I a friend, but uh, probably another 20 or so of us who went to school with Marchione at St. Michael's College. You came a little later, Flavio, uh, back in the late middle and late 60s. Now, Sergio was about uh, three or four years younger than most of us. Yes, I'm older than Sergio. Um, and uh, he, when he arrived at 15, 14, 15, he was bigger than most grade nine students. He was definitely smarter, more cultured, uh, and spoke already three languages. And frankly, he found it very difficult to hang out with those niners, uh, as we call them at St. Mike's. We used to call them at St. Mike's. He eventually found uh, myself and a bunch of other, Di Zio, Di Poche, Di Favre, <laughs> etc., Frasca, uh, and was gravitated towards us because, like him, we had emigrated from Italy. Some of us, as myself, in the 50s, others in the earlier, earlier 60s. And uh, therefore, we spent for about three years almost every lunch hour together. Uh, mostly talking, joking, arguing. Sergio was uh, a master, uh, a disruptor. 
he was uh, both very arrogant, eloquent, and humble at the same time. And um, I remember on many occasions having to, quote, unquote, separate two Sergios because there was another Sergio who also had come from uh, that part of uh, the old Yugoslavia where his mother had come from. And somehow they were on opposite sides of most arguments, uh, whether it was communism or socialism versus capitalism, whether it was Italy versus Yugoslavia. I won't mention his last name, but he became one of the biggest the capitalists, this other Sergio in Toronto. <laughs> he, he he worked for a bank for 20, 30 years, giving out loaning money to large Italian construction companies. But my days of knowing Sergio at that time and subsequently in the early 70s is that he, uh, we, we all knew that he had, he would succeed in whatever he tried, whatever he wanted to do, whether it was philosophy or religion or uh, whether it was accounting that he eventually had a, a degree in or law that he also had a degree in. He could succeed because he had a sheer will to, to kind of fight, disrupt, but he was on most occasions right. He was just not, quote unquote, mature when he was 15. He was smarter than he was mature. Uh, I then did not see Sergio for many years. He got married. I got married. I did what I had to do, whatever, uh, what I could. He did what he thought he could, and he ended up in Europe. So we didn't see each other until probably back in the early two, uh, 2000s when we reconnected because of his more frequent trips to visit his mother back in Toronto, and whom I knew quite well because on many occasions his mother would say, sometimes she forgot my name at Villa Colombo when she visited Villa Colombo twice a week. She would say, ah, tu sei l'amico di Sergio. So that was my, my famousness with her. <laughs> but uh, with many, many other friends in the Toronto community, business community, after it got out that I and others were Sergio's friends from way back when, it became very, I became very popular. All of a sudden, I wasn't the older statesman. Uh, the important Toronto person that I perhaps never was, but certainly I was famous now because I was Sergio's friends. And the, I guess the first half a dozen calls that I received from the many business people and politicians or, or other people who wanted to contact Sergio, I felt good that I was somehow helping Sergio or helping them. Soon I discovered that I had to say, look, I'm his friend. I'm not his social coordinator, and no, I cannot get you to see him or sell your product to Sergio, and I still try to help, but I, I almost had to uh, renounce that, that kind of friendship because I could not abuse Sergio. He never said no to me on whatever I personally asked, which wasn't much. I asked him for two things. One, I wanted to be the first one to buy a Fiat Cinquecento. I was luckier because he gave it to me for free. However, oh. not to Bell personally, <laughs> I was for many years the um, CEO of a community foundation in Toronto, Villa Charities. And when we asked him for a car, he made sure that we got one, which we then sold at a public auction uh, in a, one of our many balls for about three times the value that the stated uh, value was. Okay. However, I must confess, I did buy with my money two of Sergio's cars, a yellow one and a red one, just to keep my kids and my mother-in-law happy. <laughs> and the They're only fun. other conflict I will state is that I was lucky enough to have Sergio welcome, not me, my two boys at the, the Fiat, um, spot in the, the now Allianz uh, uh, Park in, in Torino to see the Juventus or other games that uh, they played. But uh, since I um, reconnected yes. with him in the early 2000s, 
Uh, he is all of those things that everybody else has already talked about. Uh, plus, I, you know, Sergio and I and our friends, oh, yeah. we never talked about business. It was always about yes. I migliori we, anni. We will get back to that. Experience at St. Mike's. Yeah. We will get back to that, Paul, again. But I like now to ask a question to Tommy. Um, I'm traveling in these days in Italy, and what I've done is to ask some people how they feel about Marchionne, right? Uh, because Marchionne, uh, for me, for many people, we know we, we know the kind of icon and the kind of weight that, that his image, his experience carries. Tell me, what is the general perception in Italy? Am I wrong to say that he's more controversial than, than Canada? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I can tell you uh, a couple of things. First of all, um, you know, Marchione is very contro is a controversial figure in Italy, very divisive, um, and he was very, really under pressure here. Uh, he, you know, as 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 as, as uh, we said earlier on the panel, you know, he had he, he didn't have an easy, easy life in Italy. You know, he always had you know bodyguards around. Uh, he uh, was uh, at the center of. Uh, many uh, uh potential uh, uh, you know terrorist attack and all these things uh, and there was a period when he was really trying to change the way italian works he really told and you know you you knew Sergio much better than me he really told that he could change somehow the way we do business in italy uh and for me he was revolutionary in what he was doing uh, unfortunately, uh, in Italy, he was seen as a reactionary figure, uh, uh, while he was just trying to find a spot uh, for the Italian plants uh, in a global car maker. So his view was, uh, if you want to make cars in Italy, you have to be competitive with the rest of the world. You can just pretend you make cars in Italy because Italy is a, is a nice place to, to, to live, uh, and you can pretend Italy is a peculiar place, and you uh, you uh, you need to have different rules there. This was uh, his battle for the country, and he was left alone. I clearly recall once we had a long chat uh, in his office in Turin, and he told me, you know, we won the referendum on uh, the, you know, with the, with works in Italy by a tiny majority. Uh, I'm trying to change, you know, you know, the industrial landscape of the country. I'm going to build Jeep in Italy to be sold in the U.S. If you imagine, you know, it's something really exceptional. I think that it was, you know, the the the, the Jeep Renegade built uh, and you know, designed in Italy to be sold in the U.S. market was it one of his really most even more iconic than the 500. The 500 will be remembered for everything, but he managed to build. Uh, a jeep for Americans and Europeans in Basilicata in the middle of nowhere and to ship into the US. And this is really a legacy for that he left in the country. He saved a plant, the only, the only probably industrial plant that there is in Italy south of Naples is the one in Melk in Basilicata. And he decided to go there and to build some jeep. It was a different world, a more global world. Now, you know, things have changed, but at the time he used to build jeep there shipped to the Salerno port, from Salerno to the US and sold to the Americans as an American product. This was, for me, remarkable. Anyway, he used to tell me, you know, they, they, I was left alone here. I was left alone. No one of the leader, the business leader, the political leaders of the country were close to me. Uh, now that things are going well, they all come and say, hey, buddy, you know, we were with you from the beginning, but that's not true. I was left alone. And he was really under pressure. So there was a period uh, in 2010, 2011, when I used to travel to Detroit just to speak with him because uh, he was much more relaxed. He could spend time with journalists. He was really, you know, he, he felt, you know, in, it was when he, uh, he, had, he was saving Chrysler, okay? And in Detroit, there was this sense that Sergio came and really rescued a car maker in the city, you know, the imported from Detroit, the eminent spot, that, that this was real, okay? And at the same time, in Italy, it was already forgotten the fact that you have said Fiat, and he was seen as someone, you know, trying to change the status quo. He was not very diplomatic, as you know better than me, 
and he at a certain point decided to give it up give up to the Italian public opinion okay uh, some other people used to go on TV and say you know he's a fascist uh, he doesn't want he doesn't care about workers uh, he doesn't care about workers right he tried to respond then he figured out that this was not his job and he essentially gave up and so this has remained in Italy a lot uh, and until he died I would say he was still very divisive and somehow the way I told the story which is not the ultimate story about Sergio Marchione is only you know the, the part of his life that I follow closely and the fact that I used to speak with him quite a lot in the last part of his years um, somehow gave changed a bit the perspective that Italians have uh, with, with with Sergio now okay M much more people now really somehow understood what he wanted to do that doesn't mean he was you know uh, uh he was a perfect man yet you know uh, it, it was not an easy person to deal with but what i really think uh, and that's one of the reason that i really wanted to write the book is that uh, he was really intellectually honest okay he really what he what what he did it he did it because he thought it was right to do it not for any other reason and that for me is crucial you know and then obviously he was obsessed by the fact that he wanted to be uh you know uh, uh to fix a fiat uh and, and this is, is another you know and the fact that i see that my video i hope you see uh, some my videos not doing well anyway let me finish and i pass it to you then we try to fix the video he was obsessed by the fact that he wanted to be you know uh the the number one ceo in the industry and to save fiat forever this was an obsession and he essentially spent spent big part of his the last years of his life trying to to make this obsession become real and my question has always been and that's one of the reasons why i wrote the book because i'm making myself the same question and you know bureau chief of bloomberg i you know i, I have a work-life balance uh, quite difficult and i'm always asking myself is it right to dedicate all yourself to your job and somehow to uh, not spend enough time with your family with your kids with your friends uh, that's you know and and you know at the, at the end of the day when i discover i realized that sergio was uh, sick uh, that was you know weeks before weeks or days before it became public just because it was i wrote this in the book so i'm not this he wasn't answering my my whatsapp anymore and it was not uh, normal for him somehow okay uh, there, there was something weird you know ferrari won the grand premio and he didn't reply to anyone that was not normal anyway and i you know somehow realized that you know he could he could not come back the question i i made myself is you know and i was on a holiday with my kids in the two weeks when i tried to switch off the phone every summer i used to make myself the question you know is it is it right to spend your life for you know just what you think is right on your professional side or you need to find a balance and not lose you know part of your life and i don't have an answer okay and the, but this is the other reason why somehow I, I i wrote the book one is what you mentioned the fact that it was very controversial in italy and they wanted to somehow try to give what i thought was his view his honest view on on on, on his job and on his uh, on his career and, and the other is is it worth you know and i give you i mean, I, I leave, I, I leave a, to you uh, if you have any you know thought about it and and you know i love to to listen sure and i and i thank you tommy thank you and i want to say uh, i'd like to have the three of you now the four of you speaking about one sentence that in a way could summarize the the greatness of sergio marchione because i'm sure you are familiar with this center with this sentence fix it again tony <laughs> Do you know this sentence, what it means, all of you? Yeah. Can you tell me how you relate to this sentence? Well, I'll tell you because that is an old, old acronym. Uh, Sergio was uh, one of the first amongst uh, all of our, our, my friends to have a car. He showed up with a kind of a white imported Fiat, which was made for maybe Chieti, but it wasn't made for Toronto because <laughs> it, it was always uh, rusty or it became rusty fast and, and it had to be fixed. And uh, during those days, it was either a Ford fix or repair daily or Tony uh, or 
fix it again, Tony. And so it 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 weighed on the our, on us Italian Canadians, at least at St. Mike's, that we had to somehow defend. But to some degree, the fiat of those days was. Uh, properly well named because it, it had to be fixed or repaired daily in the now unnice roads of Toronto. But I, I, I'll say this and I'll try to be quiet. Back in 19, uh, 2010, I was in a, a restaurant in Venezia, Do Forni, and wow. uh, someone must have told, uh, said hello to me, you're from Toronto. And I said, yes. And my first question I was asked by this elderly lawyer, oh, Sergio Marchione. And, and I, by coincidence, I said, well, I went to school with him. All of a sudden, this man loved me only because I was Sergio's friend. But he told me two things, that at that time in Italy, Sergio Marchione was seen between Padre Pio and Sergio. He <laughs> said they were the only two moral, upright people he knew. <laughs> In Toronto, that is probably still accepted truth. Sergio and Padre Pio, you will see in every uh, kind of restaurant and, and cafe shop. Uh, with regards to Italy, I think Padre Pio is still there. Sergio may have fallen off the, the altar a bit. Flavio, Sandra, how you relate to this sentence? What does it remind you? He, he, he fixed it. He was the Tony in that uh, sentence. And uh, there was no again. So one of the things uh, that uh, that uh, in this role, you know, he taught all of us uh, trying to sell parts to FCA was we can build at a global standard around the world. We figured out how to take that that top uh, quality, that Toyota production system, and then make any one of the Fiat Chrysler brands around the world. So don't sell me on quality uh, because I'm obsessed with it. Uh, you know, give me new ideas. And one, a very, very important car uh, that he launched uh, was the last generation Greek Jeep Grand Cherokee. So if you could picture a Grand Cherokee uh, 2010 to just change this year, that was the most awarded SUV in the history of the business, but also taking an iconic American brand and bringing it up to when it was launched to comparisons with uh, BMW, comparisons uh, with uh, with uh, um, Mercedes product. Of course, there was this Chry Daimler Chrysler merger that preceded Sergio, and he had some of the pieces that could go in there. What he did in that vehicle was uh, save another iconic American brand, brought it up the ladder on quality. There was no fix it again Jeep, and that. Anybody who's watching here who knows what a Maserati Levante is, which is Maserati's, you know, an Italian supercar company building SUVs, uh, in a in a a company with a brand uh, reputation of being uh, beautiful but a little bit unreliable. Well, this Maserati Levante is the Jeep Grand Cherokee with Italian skin and Italian engines, and uh, that. SUV sales for Maserati will bring it success that it would never have had to make other sports cars. And it comes from the core principle, you know, Pal uh, uh, described him in one of his character traits was an arrogance. Well, he had this arrogant idea that we can break all the stereotypes of Italian automakers and Italian businesses and Italian brands. And it isn't just about beauty and, uh, and La Dolce Vita, but we can make the absolute best. So for people in China buying $200,000 Maserati SUVs is because Sergio probably drove probably what was a, a Fiat 650 or an 850. And he said, yeah, I might romanticize where I came from, but I'm going to absolutely change it. And in the business, there is no, I, I, I hear you, Tommy, when you say, you know, he's a, he's a figure of controversy in Italy from a support from the, the suppliers, from uh, the, the next generation of leaders that come up behind him. Uh, I, there's just one image of him that, that stands above, which is when Donald Trump uh, got elected, uh, 
and decided he wanted to tear up the North American Free Trade Agreement. And he called on the carpet, the three American automakers, and said, I'm not going to be on your side. I'm going to be on the side of American uh, auto workers and steel workers. Uh, and then after having whipped them, uh, decided to go out and do a press conference in front of uh, the White House. Well, Sergio Marchione showed up in the same black sweater that Pal did. And he also didn't appear in that post-conference. He did not give, he did not give uh, credence uh, or lent his name or his face uh, to Donald Trump in a really, really tough time for the industry. And ultimately, mm-hmm. history has shown that uh, he was on the right side of it. I, but I noted it. I said, this guy isn't out there with the president of the United States while his two counterparts are at the other two Detroit companies. And it, and it said a lot about who that person was. Moral arrogance yeah. as opposed to just arrogance. Yeah. 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 Sandra, Sandra yeah. I want to ask you, I want to ask you a question. Yeah. It encompasses the, uh, at one point, you are a younger energetic minister of Ontario and you go to Turin. Can you, can you set the portrait of the time? What was happening at the time? Why, were, why did you go to Turin? What was well, Ontario doing there? Spanned several years there. Um, Flavio will remember this well, because when he came to work at Queen's Park, uh, we embarked on this. We're chasing an OEM. I mean, we were determined. And uh, Flavio, I hope you were laughing when Tomas was talking about an airplane that turned into a prop because it yeah. evoked a whole other story that we've had together about planes. Anyway, um, but at the time, I mean, we were always chasing investment. That's what our job was. And uh, that's exactly what we were doing there. So the idea that he was going to give us an audience, I mean, when I thought when we knew we were going to talk today, it, it just sent me back to those days of having lunch with him at his headquarters. Uh, you talked about how we used to be a chain smoker. It turned out that uh, the week before I took that trip in March of 2011, I had just quit smoking. There I was at the table at lunch with Sergio and he was smoking one after the other and I was dying to have a cigarette. And I kept saying, no, 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 I'm, I'm good, I'm good. Cause he kept offering cause he knew that I smoked. Maybe that's how we bonded anyway. And at that same lunch, uh, I remember he had three phones. Uh, I, I don't even remember if they were Blackberries, but one after the other, one for Fiat, one for Chrysler, one for uh, Case Holland, which of course the company was also CEO. Um, anyway, so, oh yeah, maybe five phones, but that lunch he had three phones. And I said, seriously, you've got three phones? And he said, oh yeah. He says, I, I, I'd shut them off, but I'm waiting. I may get a call here. So he was like, constantly working you and for, fortunately it did the phones didn't ring we were there for four hours i remember flavio desperately wanted to go on that trip because he knew that i was going to get to see the collection his his car collection <laughs> in, in his garage and yeah. you know four hours later we did a walk and we went into the garage and all flavio wanted to know was did you get to see the cars and i said <laughs> tell me about the ferraris and I remember it must have been an email or I said, well, there's a blue one, and a yellow one and a red one. I mean, really, I wasn't that interested in the cars. I was interested in the investment, but I thought I was being funny. And Flavio was like, I cannot believe you did not get more detail about these cars anyway. Um, but he was a you know consummate professional. Uh, and the only other thing I wanted to add to get in today was he had insight about society. And when I hear both you, uh, Pal talking and, and Tomas, he really understood society. Um, he was speaking at the Royal York. It was a leadership conference or something. And he was one of the big speakers there. And it was in the era of, do you remember the 99% uh, protests? Yeah. And taking over Central Park and they were all over North America. They were in the U.S. And it was this time of anonymous with that mask symbol yes. uh, that was all over the world. And it was at that time that he was speaking and all I would say corporate, corporate Canada, corporate in the world were very much anti these protesters that were just intent on disruption and, you know, calling all of corporate bad. But Sergio, at a stage in front of 500 people, a key, you know, corporate elites, and he said, we need to listen to these people. Uh, never mind what they're doing in terms of a protest, but you need to ask yourself, why are we doing this? What kind of inequity are they feeling? 
And, you know, in the middle of the truck convoy in Canada, not that long ago, I kept thinking back to what Sergio said during the 99% protests. He was the only one that was actually sympathetic to a point of, we're not listening. When you have that kind of a response, you need to listen. And I was really struck by the fact he was really the only guy, the big corporate guy that was really ta not taking their side, but really. And, and, I, want, and I want to elaborate. Sorry. Uh, I want to elaborate on this concept. And we have 10 minutes, so I would like everybody to talk if it's possible, uh, because there's, a, there's a something interesting. We're talking about le legacy mm. and... Uh, I would like to know from you guys, because a chapter of the book is about uh, somebody question him, his vision of the future. Not much as a leader or as a CEO, but the vision of the future, the electric car, the environmental issues. Where, where are we going exactly? And uh, I would like to start from Tommy. Uh, Tommy, did he have a vision for the future? I know that he wanted to join all the car industry. He wanted to be the king and, and he, we, 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 definitely some reasons. But did he understand where the, the whole issue of transportation was going? The, que the question is, uh, do we know now where all the issue of transportation is going? So that's the question. I'm not covering anymore so closely the auto industry now, you know, managing managing the newsroom in italy I have to cover you know all other stuff so i much less an expert than i used to be uh but i remember really i mean i spent one night with in 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 a ts place uh, in in uh, in uh, michigan in, in january 2018 we had a long night drinking a lot of grappa he wanted me to taste all the grappa get there uh with and we had a nice dinner and and, and a long chat uh, uh which was actually his last interview and he was very i mean it was a very you know when on this evening when you really speak about everything and somehow deeply and so uh we ended up talking about the future of the out of the car industry you know he was known to be not a electric car enthusiast i would say just because he was a very pragmatic person as a as leader of Fiat Chrysler, okay? He thought uh, that before was not the right time to invest in electric cars. And he also thought that uh, car the electric cars as they are made now will not be the final solution. Um, and uh, then he, that night he, he told me that he understood that the things were changing, that, uh, that um, uh, consumers on one side, uh, Policymakers on the others were pushing for transformation of the car industry into electrification. Okay, and so he said, you know, in, in the next five years we'll see more and more electrification. We have to go there, and that's happened. But I think that one question remains open. So in the last year, I've signed to a car subscription when I can pick up uh, every time a different car uh, because I live in Milan. I don't, I don't have a don't need to own a car, I just pick up the car when I do some travel. So I, I have this subscription with the with the uh, Stellantis group sort of when I can, you know, decide which car to pick because I wanted to test, you know, electric cars, hybrid cars, and so on. So it's happened one year ago. So if one year I mean testing all the different uh, you know kind of engines and how it I can tell you, you know, electric cars are still a niche product for wealthy people. And uh, hybrid cars, as Marchione understood really well, are just a, you know, transitional uh, uh, vehicles uh, as uh, you are obliged to get to electric cars. But if you don't have a garage and if you live in a city in Europe, you don't have a garage until, unless you are Sergio Marchione as, <laughs> because you can own <laughs> a big garage. But um, uh, is you don't find places to recharge your car uh it's very complicated uh, uh, the hybrid cars uh, range is very short uh, if you just do 40 kilometers a day then okay you can recharge your electric car if not this you're just going to use you know old old petrol cars and you know and have a second engine in your car which way double the way of the car so overall i say okay we have decided we it's too polluting we have to go to electric cars but 
are we really going there? Uh, there is the risk that two years from now, people will realize that it's not economic viable to have just electric cars. Will electric cars, as ide ideologically we all think, are the solution for the future, the real solution for the future? I'm not completely sure about it. And Markionic contrarian approach was that I, we have to be open-minded. We have to be open to different, you know, uh, uh to different way of uh, uh to def to different uh, uh, engines in the future and so and also you know i remember yeah, at that at that time we were all about the car sharing and self driving cars uh, and i remember we were all expecting that in 2 years uh, self driving cars will be all around and car everything would be car sharing then COVID arrived. People don't want to share the car anymore, at least, at least, at least in Europe. Um, uh, Self-driving cars are still far away from arriving, and 80% of the people are still driving their private, uh, you know, uh, 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 petrol car to work every day. So the question is, uh, you know, we have been discussing a lot about the future, but the reality is that we are moving to an electrification in Europe for sure, driven by policymakers and not by consumer. What Sergio was writing saying, then I, I stop, um, I, I finish, is that uh, something happened when it's consumer driving the change. So if people want to drive electric cars and ready to pay the cost of an electric vehicle, then we're going to get there. But as long this is uh, driven by incentive and policymakers, this is not healthy for the market. You have one minute each to tell me what do you think about uh, Marchionne, his relationship with the environmental issues and his vision for the future? One minute each, please. Thank you. Let me just do it uh, really quickly. Uh, it's too, th there's too much to say in one minute. I'll say this. I know, um, I know. I'll say that uh, his candor, uh, his willingness to share that candor in that, in what Tommy just described, is what made him unique. And a lot of the other corporate leaders would uh, not take the chance to tell the policymakers that perhaps that they were wrong. And so he, in fact, was the number one CEO in automotive, uh, Tommy. I, if he was obsessed with it, I assure you there was no doubt around the world. And uh, the example that he set for Italian Canadians, you know, that specific community, is that um, his footsteps were so big that generations of us will be standing inside them, reflecting on him forever. Uh, he you. he was an icon. Per noi, he's l'eroe dei due mondi, uh, with all respect to Mr. Garibaldi. And, and certainly he probably uh, will remain that in Canada uh, for Canadians and Italian Canadians. He also understood that, yes, electric is probably where we could or should go but you got to be practical about it until you get there, until we're ready, until whether the population or other things come up to make it possible. Yeah, and I, he was, you know, he was the first one to come out, as Tomas mentioned, that he, he pushed for consolidation in the marketplace amongst the OEs. And he also called on the car companies to work together on research. So no one company can afford the amount of investment required to prepare for the future of automotive. And some have taken him up on that, but not many. And I think he was right. So I think a lot of us will step back and realize he knew his stuff and he wasn't afraid to, to tell people about what they should be doing, even if they didn't want to hear it. So Tommy, I, I really think at this point, and we are at the end of the, the, the event, uh, I really think you, you could bring, if you want, this message to Italy. Uh, Canada strongly believes that there is really a, 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 an incredible legacy by this man. He not only was a story, but he made history. Uh, it started with a, 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 a funny sentence, fix it again, Tony, but he really changed. Uh, and uh, that change that he did, he did also because he was an immigrant, because he had to fight hard from the very beginning. There's no rhetoric, it's the truth. It's his life that says it. And, uh, and I think we all, Hope, you know that even in Canada we won't forget his contribution, which is uh, huge, uh, and also is not just about contribution. Uh, the greatness of a leader, uh, that's what I always been told, and what I learned reading books, is uh, 
if you are able, if a leader is able to leave another leader behind him or behind her, and uh, perhaps before before I we really say bye to everybody, I would like to ask you, Tony, Tommy, sorry, is there there is Marchione's leader? Is there is there is a leader? His hair is around. Uh, so uh, let me conclude. First of all, thank you very much, all of you. Uh, I mean, this is, this was one of these events when you know I get I get away with much more you know uh, things that they brought in the conversation, uh, and so it, it was a big pleasure. I really hope we can do something really uh, in person in Toronto sooner or later. Uh, um, I'm, I don't know if Marciano left one leader, but he, he left a leadership culture, okay? Uh, uh, the people who work with Sergio, you know, learn from him the, the culture of uh, zero bullshit, I'm sorry for the word, and to, to work hard to make it done. And every time I meet one of them, they told me, you know, it was tough to work for Sergio but I will do it from scratch uh, because I learned so many things uh, uh, working with him that uh, that period of my life, uh, you know, I will remember it forever. So I think he really gave more than his legacy is more than a car company. His legacy is a leadership culture. And um, this is something that you, f you, you really uh, feel when you meet people who had the opportunity to work. Uh, in Fiat and Chrysler under Sergio. Thank you, thank you, Tommaso Ebert, for for really for having come and and having spoken and having presented your books, Sergio Marchione, great book, really. I say I recommend really the people read it. It's really an incredible story. Thank you, Paul Di Giulio. Thank you, Sandra Pupatello, and a special thank to uh, Flavio Volpe, not just for your insight into the car industry, but for partnering also with us. On, on behalf of AMPA and on, on behalf of the board of directors of ECO Canada, I want to thank everybody. I want to thank my office, if you allow me, <clears throat> just a few seconds, to thank Ilaria, uh, Mary, uh, Tiziana, Richard, Monica, uh, Astrid, Marisa. These people have made possible the event today. They've been incredibly good. We were connecting while I was traveling. These are no easy days in Europe, as you know. The conflict here is felt really in a heavier way than, I, at least this is my feeling, than in Canada. And, and it is probably also a different situation. So it was difficult to work, but they made it. They, 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 thank you very much. Thank you, all of you. Uh, please uh, uh, remain tuned with our activities. Become a member. Thank you for everything and have a great day. Thank you. <laughs> Ciao. Grazie a tutti. Ciao. Ciao. Ciao.